This part of the lecture is about computational models and how they figure in explanations in neuroscience. So firstly, we need to say a bit about what computational models are. Nowadays, they're used pretty much everywhere in science. Um, one really important example is computational models of weather systems. So these can be simulations of particular um, weather events that happen, like a tornado. What you have is a set of really complicated dynamical equations about how um, things like pressure and temperature change over time and how these give rise to these wind patterns that swirl around like in this tornado. But the thing about a computational model of a tornado is that no one would say that the tornado itself is computing anything or that it is a computer. We're happy to say that this is just a simulation, a recreation in digital form of this physical event. What's interesting about computational models in neuroscience is that people go further than that and often go into the claim that the brain itself is performing computations. And that becomes really important in their big picture theory of how the brain gives rise to cognition. This way of thinking about computational models goes back quite far in the history of neuroscience. So here you have some diagrams on the right from McCulloch and Pitts from their seminal work on neural networks in the brain. So in the early days of neurophysiology, already people had the idea that if you think about how neurons signal to one another, causing um, one neuron next to it to activate and um, fire more ac action potentials because of a signal that it's received, that these patterns of connections could be equivalent to logic gates that are found in digital computers. So McCulloch and Pitt's idea was that the brain is full of these mini logic gates that all together form a big computing system and that the fact that the brain is doing computing gives you an explanation of how it is that the brain gives rise to cognition. So ultimately, how you think. And you can see that this is an appealing connection to make because if you look at what artificial computers around us do, they're doing us a lot of the jobs that originally we relied on um, thinking human beings to do. Just simple things like arithmetic, calculation, nowadays, object recognition and speech production. All of these cognition-like processes have been recreated in machines and so if you can say, well, the brain itself is a biological computer, you can explain why a physical system like the brain ultimately gives rise to cognition. So this hypothesis that the brain itself is an information processor is known as the computational theory of mind. And it's one of the central explanations for the functioning of the brain as the organ of thought. Once you have the idea that the brain is an information processor in place, you can ask and answer different kinds of explanatory questions than you can get from thinking about the brain as purely this causal system of processes which do not have a particular connection with cognition. So I've given some examples of explanatory questions on this slide about why certain things happen in the visual cortex. Now, in answer to all of these questions, you can refer to um, the causal processes of electro electrical excitation and causing certain physiological changes in the brain in response to the input of certain visual stimuli. But at the same time, you can also um, give answers to these questions, which refer to these physiological processes having a role in computational procedures, which are part of a bigger picture theory of what the visual cortex is doing. So this was an idea that was developed um, a few decades ago by some very influential work from David Ma, also in collaboration with Shimon Ullman, who developed this theory of the visual cortex in the book called Vision. And his idea was to take physiological results, like the responses of these cells in the retina and 
uh, um, in the brain, called the LGN structure in the brain, um, they showed these physiological responses to light. And he was modeling them computationally by um, referring to functions like this Laplacian of Gaussian function. So there was this equivalence between the mathematical model and the physiological data. But not only was this just a mathematical representation of this physiological response, he was also arguing that the, the computation itself described mathematically with this function is a way to perform the same task that the early visual system is doing. So if you take the task of edge detection, if you think of a pixelated array of light patterns like you get with the photoreceptors in the eye, one of the information processing tasks that you can do is look for where the edges are in the image. And one way to do that mathematically is to use this Laplacian of Gaussian transform on the image. And Ma was arguing that that's what the cells in the retina themselves were doing to that pixel array at the photoreceptor. So by thinking of the retina as part of this long series of information processing transforms that goes on and can be described mathematically, you can form sort of big picture explanations of what the visual system is doing as this hierarchical series of image processing steps. And then that allows you to theorize that how what vision ultimately is, is this computational process. So this is an idea that's been very influential. This is a textbook from um, Diane and Abbott talking about different kinds of models in neuroscience. And they draw a contrast between mechanistic models, which just describe how things work in neuroscience, and interpretative models, which tell you the information processing rationale or functional reasons why something um, should be arranged like this in the brain. So showing that the purpose almost of certain physiological processes in the brain is there because they facilitate certain capacities which are ultimately cognitive ones, gives rise to thought. And one of the debates that's been going on recently in philosophy of neuroscience is between people that think that all explanations in neuroscience are mechanistic ones, and people like myself, Francis Egan, and Daniel Weisskopf, who think that there are some kinds of explanations in neuroscience which are fundamentally not mechanistic ones. And this debate has turned on examples like computational models, where what I and others have been arguing is that you have examples of computational models which do not satisfy the criteria for being descriptions of mechanisms. So if you think back to that 3M mapping criterion, we're saying that that condition doesn't hold. These models do not refer to entities within neurons or neural systems that we can say are representing parts of mechanisms. And yet, they do offer explanations. So this example here is that model of the um, retinal ganglion cell as a Laplacian of Gaussian filter. And it's not depicting any of the parts of the neuron. So it's not describing the neuron in terms of its mechanistic operations. And yet, by fitting this model into a larger story of information processing in the brain, it does answer certain explanatory questions about why these physiological responses should occur at this stage of the visual system. So how I think of this is it's a why question, why should the neurons fire in this way, which is similar to the why question that we had at the start of this lecture about why birds migrate. You can t appeal to the adap adaptive and functional um, reasons why certain processes happen in biology because ultimately they enable animals to do certain things. And this is different from the causal explanation of just why does something happen because a certain process has happened before it and had a causal effect.